Department of Education. It let every family with a child in the public school system know about how the DOE handles immigration issues. Uh, the teachers and the administration don't know a child's immigration status unless a family chooses to share that. And if they share, it's confidential. <coughs> the letter included information about whether or not law enforcement is allowed into schools for the purposes of immigration raids. There was a section on frequently asked questions um, that addressed if there was any cause for extra worry in light of recent developments. And the letter was meant to calm and inform, of course, but mostly it just incensed me, if I'm honest. And as I was saying to another grown up in the room, that I was heart sore that such a letter was even necessary, um, that we live in such times that parents have to worry that their children might be taken from school, um, my oldest overheard, and my American for many generations, very white little kid said, fear lighting his eyes, are we gonna be okay? Is everything okay? And I'll admit to you that sometimes I lie to my children. <laughs> or at least, I'll put it a little spin on it, at least I tell them what I wish will become true, right? I think that's an important distinction, not just a willful lie. And so I said, yes. I said, we're gonna be okay, you and your friends are gonna be okay. And in the way of five-year-olds, that was enough for the moment. But I don't actually know that all of his friends are gonna be okay. I don't, I don't know that. I'm sure that that Maasai greeting is familiar to many of you, that idea of, a, of this tribe of fierce warriors that they greet each other by asking, how are the children? You've probably heard this before. And at first it can seem a little surprising, right, that that's the sort of the fierceness of the tribe, but then this almost gentle question. But when you consider, as Patrick O'Neill encourages us to, that the children are what make the fighting worth it, right, then it makes some sense. The defense of the community, the fighting that is, that is necessary, it's all for the children, it's all for the future. It's for a better world that might yet come in which the fighting would no longer be necessary. And as I was rereading O'Neill's piece, I was struck by that use of the word all. All the children are well. It's not qualified, not the children of the town elders are well, or the children of the rich members of the tribe are well, or the male children are well, or the straight children are well. All the children are well. <coughs> we wonder what would happen if we oriented ourselves this way, if that were our greeting and the response that we always wanted to be able to give. All the children are well. The thing is, we know that all the children aren't well, we know that a little girl who was only four months old was not allowed into the country last weekend to have life-saving heart surgery. And I will tell you, I read last night that New York State managed to get her in on a waiver and Mount Sinai is doing her heart surgery for free. So she likely would have died otherwise. We know that young black men across this country are treated worse given more harsh punishments by teachers and schools and the police because of the color of their skin. We know that children in nearby Lewisboro were confronted with swastikas on the grounds of their elementary school. We know that in many places in this country and in this world, trans boys and girls are denied the right to live their lives fully and unafraid. And I could go on, but I won't because I know that you know that by and large, across this world, the children aren't really all well. They're subject to prejudices and to violence and to manipulation and abuse by other children and adults. And we know it isn't just the children. We know that we adults are also subject to suffering at the hands or at the ideals of our fellow humans. And again, I don't need to point to the examples. You and I both know it is a true fact of life that we, all of us, children of humanity, children of God, children of the earth, whatever phrase you want to use, all of us children suffer, and many times in ways that are utterly unnecessary and are preventable. And despite that, despite all that we see around us, despite all we know about how we can treat each other so badly, despite the reality that my child's friends may not be okay, I still believe in goodness, and I still believe in grace. 
I've always loved that hymn, Amazing Grace. I even like to sing the original word, wretch, even though it does not reflect my theological orientation. I don't believe that we are wretches born in need of salvation, right? But I do believe in grace. I believe in an amazing grace that is available to all of us, defined as it was in our time for all ages, right? As gifts that are given, not because we have done something or not done something, not because of what we do or don't believe, simply because. And I don't believe that that grace is a gift from a God that is saving us from our horrible sins. I believe it is a gift that we give to each other as a way to save us and make us our best selves. A gift of recognizing that every child, every adult they become is a being that came into this world with the potential for great good. I don't believe children are born bad or evil. I believe that all of us were born with blessings and with hope and with possibility. And it is our responsibility as members of the human family to do everything we can to help every child grow into the best, most authentic, most honest version of themselves. That means prioritizing them, right? Prioritizing their wellness in mind and body and spirit. And in truth, it's a responsibility that extends well past childhood. It's one we bear for each other, even in adulthood. All of us children of being are called to offer each other a gift of grace, a gift that we give each other though we are doing nothing or have done nothing to earn it in any classical sense of the word, earn. The gift of grace that we offer to each other, the gift of grace that is so amazing there are songs about it, is to me the gift of affirmation, of wealth, and what's more, of celebration. When I was in college, some of you know this, I was pretty miserable my first year of college. I'd gone from New York City to small town Massachusetts, and I got a ride to the nearest UU congregation, which was about 40 minutes away. And at that time, this small sort of house church, they met in the living room, was honoring an individual who was transitioning to womanhood. There was a ceremony to affirm her and celebrate her, her authentic life and her authentic name. And I had never encountered a naming ceremony before, and all I could think was, this is amazing, incredible, wonderful. This woman is able to fully be herself and not be just tolerated, not even just be welcomed, but be celebrated, actively celebrated. And I remember thinking, this matters. Celebrating people for who they are, no matter their gender expression or physical form or ability or sexual orientation, it isn't enough to welcome. We have to celebrate. That celebration is a form of grace. It's a way to give love to each other for simply being ourselves. It's an underrated gift that can make a difference in someone's life, moving them from isolation and despair to fullness and community. I actually want to take a minute, um, and I want to invite you to sit quietly with me for a moment and to consider if there's a part of you, a part of your identity, that has ever given you cause to worry about the welcome you would receive. Right? So we'll sit together for a minute, and, and after a moment, if and only if you feel comfortable, I'll invite you to, to speak that out into this space. But so to consider if there's a part of you that has ever caused you to worry that you would not be here. Take some deep breaths and sit for a moment. So if and only if you feel comfortable, and I won't call on anyone, you can just speak it out into this space and share with them. When I was a child, I lived for a time with my grandparents, while my parents were off in school. 
and I went to this small one-room school, and I thought I felt as if I was the city kid who had come to this place, and that that I got. I didn't really belong there. I sort of resented being there in a way, so I was maybe was pushing that over on them. In fact, later it turned out that I probably was, because some couple of years after all that was finished with, I ran into several of the girls from the from the um, school, and they were so friendly and, and open and. And it was a wonderful release from feeling like I was probably not liked very much there. Mm -hmm. I remember as a child, when I guess I was about 11 or 12 years old, uh, my family moved to Spain. And I clearly remember my parents at one point um, saying to me and using these words, there's no need to advertise that you're Jewish. <laughs> And that was, I didn't totally get it at that time, but, and I also have a story of my brother that this happened to several times. Uh, he lived in Korea and went to school, he went to high school there, and he would be walking in the streets of Seoul with uh, Korean, well, Korean American, a Korean girl, and he would get lit cigarette butts with that him. I'm sure that uh, many more of us have various reasons that we have at times worried about the welcome we would receive, and I'm sure that all of us can come up with thoughts about why someone would worry, the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, whether or not they've gone to college, immigration status, the language you do or do not speak, your country of origin, your physical appearance, your economic status. <coughs> For any of us who have ever held that fear inside, that fear that something outwardly visible about us will cause others to hate us or hurt us, for any of us who have ever held that fear inside that something outwardly invisible about us will somehow be discovered and will be treated differently, hurt or rejected, we know then the power of welcoming and celebration. We know that grace. We know the difference it makes when you're not just tolerated, but when the things, the truths about you are embraced and celebrated without reservation, without qualification. And that's actually what we are called to do. Affirm and welcome and celebrate without reservation, without qualification. 
One of the sources of wisdom that we turn to is the Bible, and in Matthew 25, which Nora read part of earlier, we're called to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, care for the sick, visit the prisoner, and invite the stranger to come inside. There's no ifs or ands or buts there. All the sick, all the hurting, all the hungry, all the strangers, all the children, every last one. And what is more, in so doing, we are told, it is as if we are feeding, clothing, caring for, visiting, welcoming in God. It doesn't matter if we believe in God or not. The wisdom in this text is that there is perhaps nothing more important, no spiritual call more important, no human call more important than the welcoming, caring for, and attending to every person in the human family. Because every other person on this earth is exactly that, part of the large human family of which we are but one part. I have known in my life in Unitarian Universalist congregations the power of welcoming, the power of being in a place that greets with a smile no matter what a person looks like, the power of being in a place that then celebrates those differences, the power of being in a place that tries over and over to embrace all the people who walk through our doors. And we don't do it perfectly. We know this. I'm sure we've all experienced the imperfection of us. But we are human. We mess up. And I do believe that we here and around this country and our Unitarian Universalist congregations are trying and that we have to keep trying. Maybe now more than ever. I love that Emil Lazarus poem, right? Not for us, the Colossus at Rhodes. Not for us, that giant sculpture, man spreading across an inlet. No. <laughs> Instead, we have what Emma Lazarus called the mother of exiles, with lightning quickening her torch. And I kind of wish we called her that instead of the Statue of Liberty, the mother of exiles. Right? It's kind of more powerful in a way. Welcoming all. All who have been cast out or left back or set aside and sending that welcome worldwide as we are called to by the scriptural wisdom, by our own experiences in our life and what it means to be welcomed and celebrated. We are called to that welcome and to broadcasting that welcome as far and wide as we possibly can by the values that we hold dear. We have always been called to be a house of peace, a house of welcome, a house of affirmation and celebration, but that call resounds even stronger today. As the places in which people can be safe and whole disappear, we have to commit ourselves to remaining that place. Our welcome, our celebration, our gift of grace is needed more than ever, and so we call each other to giving the gift of holy love that is grace. We call each other to offering gratitude for the gifts that we are given. And we call each other to celebrating each other. I'm going to ask you to join me in a responsive reading to close our sermon. It's number 515. <coughs> we lift up our heart in thanks, and you will do the italics. Please. 515. <coughs> For the sun and the dawn which we did not create, for the moon and the evening which we did not make, for food which we plant but cannot grow, for ants and loved ones we have not earned and cannot buy, for this gathered company which welcomes us as we are from wherever we have come, for all our free churches that keep us human and encourage us in our quest for beauty, truth, and love. For all things which come to us as gifts of being from sources beyond ourselves. Gifts of life and love and friendship, we lift up our hearts in thanks to sin. May we be forever grateful for the gifts we are given but did nothing to earn. May we continue to offer those gifts to each other. And may we continue to widen the circle of welcome around this world. So may it be. Please rise and body your spirit for our final hymn. It's 407. We're going to sit at the welcome table.
distinguishing the channels, the words that are printed in the order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. You, just as you are, are a gift to be celebrated, welcomed, affirmed. You have the ability to do that for each and every other person on this earth. Go with love, go with grace, go in peace. Mm -hmm.